Okay, my apologies, there was a slight technical <laughs> problem there. Uh, I was describing the difference between adverbials and prepositional objects. Okay, so if we take adverbials which come from, um, which are introduced by prepositions, right? So you've got a series of adverbials like in the woods, at night, with a knife, okay? Um, all of these are adverbial phrases saying how, when, where something happened. And if we use the, the verb open, okay, so we say I opened a beer at night in the woods with a knife. Okay, that verb open is, is fully finished. It has its own uh, object, a beer. Uh, and those phrases are simply adverbial phrases expressing how that happens. But other verbs are actually linked directly to prepositions. The preposition is required by that verb, okay? So when you have something like, uh, he looked after my garden, okay? So we've got the verb form here is look after. It's not that he looked and it was somehow after my garden. Uh, the verb form is look after. So what we say here is that after my garden, here this is a prepositional object, okay? We're not going to worry too much about that. Um, just that that does exist. It's another type of of object, okay? Okay, so now we know that in the sentence we've got subjects, we've got verbs, we've got objects, possibly of three different sorts, and as I mentioned, we've got adverbials. Adverbials can be anywhere in the sentence, they move around, sometimes we begin with an adverbial, sometimes in the middle. Very often we put adverbials at the end in English, especially if they are these prepositional phrases, uh, then they usually come at the end, either of the sentence or at least of, of, a, of a longer clause within the sentence. Uh, but they don't have to. You can begin a sentence, in the morning, I get up. So it's, it's, it's possible. English word order is actually much more flexible than teachers uh, at primary school level, uh, when they introduce you to the language, normally admit. Yes, that people try to tell you that there's a fixed word order in English, but actually it's, it's much more flexible. Okay. So there's one other very important element of sentences, which is something that you might not have come across uh, that much before. Okay, so this is complements, okay? Now, some verbs don't take objects, but they do take something, and what they take is a complement. And there can be complements of the subject, and there can be complements of the object, okay? So what are complements? Complements are either nouns or adjectives or nominal phrases or adjectival phrases, okay? which somehow describe either the subject or the object, okay? So they are not separate things, right? When I say I stroke the cat, I and the cat are two very different things, okay? And they're supposed to be different things. So one is the subject, one is the object. However, when I say Mr. Tiddles is a cat, right? Mr. Tiddles and cat are actually the same thing. A cat is simply a description of Mr. Tiddles. Okay? So when we use the verb to be in this way, what comes after the verb to be is not an object. It's not that Mr. Tiddles somehow is, and he does this being to a cat. Okay? Mr. Tiddles and cat, it's the same thing. So a cat is a description of Mr. Tiddles. So we don't say after the verb to be that there's an object, we say that there is a complement, okay? So the verb to be doesn't take objects, it takes subject complements, okay? A cat, this is a description of the subject, Mr. Tiddles, so it's a subject complement, okay? So the verb to be will always be like that, unless we're using it in, in the sense that of just not, I am, I exist, okay? But whenever we're using it in the normal sense, um, then we, uh, we must follow it with a complement. And the complement, as I said, can be a noun, can be an adjective. So if I say, uh, Mr. Tiddles is young, young as an adjective is a complement. If I say, Mr. Tiddles is my cat, okay? My cat is a nominal phrase, but it's still a complement, okay? It doesn't make any difference. So you've got the verb to be, but there's a whole series of other verbs, okay, 
which don't mean something is, is being done to something else, but they mean that something is being described in a certain way. So there are some obvious ones. So words like become, okay? Become is clearly very similar to be, okay? Um, other words such as seem or appear, okay? So when I say somebody appears tired, okay, again, this, this um, we say tired, of course, is an adjective, but it's working that the verb appear doesn't take an object, but it is taking a complement, okay? So there's a whole range of verbs which, which talk about change. So there's a lot of verbs which mean become, right? So, so grow, um, turn, words like that. We'll see more examples when, when we look at the, at the exercises. So all of those are taking subject complements, okay? However, there are also object complements. So object complements obviously can only occur when there is an object, all right? Uh, and object complements are, again, descriptions of the object, okay? Usually, so th this will be a description of the object and, and how it is affected by the verb, okay? So you've already got the object, and then it's what, what happens to it. So... Um, we had an example in the last lecture where we said something like the, the sun burnt the grass black, okay? So in this sentence, the word black is a complement of the object. We've got the sun as the subject, we've got burnt as the verb, we've got the grass as the object, and then black is a description of the grass, description of the object. But it isn't a simple description saying the grass is something, uh, because it's talking about how the verb burnt affected the grass. So that is followed by an object complement. Okay? And again, it can be a noun or it can be an adjective. It doesn't matter. So the tricky thing, uh, spotting object complements is not so difficult, because you have an object and then you have something said about it. So you should be able to, to, to see that. The more difficult thing is, is spotting subject complements because subject complements often look like objects uh, and people often get the two things confused, okay? Okay, so in our sentence we've got possibly, we don't have to have all of them, but we, we need a subject, we need a verb. Uh, of course, sometimes that's all there is. We have a sentence such as, I sleep, okay? And there's nothing and that's okay. Uh, but sometimes we have an object. Sometimes we have a complement, sometimes we have an adverbial, okay? And if we have an object, it may be direct or indirect or prepositional, but we're, we're not going to worry too much about that. If we have a complement, it may be a complement of the subject or a complement of the object, okay? So by using those distinctions, we can then draw a number of distinctions between types of verb forms, okay? So... We'll mention the first one, transitivity. Uh, you should all know something about transitive and intransitive verbs, I hope that you're, you're aware of that. So transitive verbs are verbs which have an object, simply, okay? If the verb has an object, it's transitive. So if it has a complement, but no object, then it is intransitive. Okay, so when we think of intransitive verbs, we normally think of examples like, like the one I just gave, like I sleep, I eat. Uh, we, we know these are intransitive, there's nothing there. But also, if there is a complement, okay, I am a teacher, this is also intransitive. So those types of sentences with the verb to be will also be intransitive because they take complements, not objects, okay? But there are... So there are intransitive and there are transitive. As far as transitive verbs are concerned, we have three different types of transitivity. Okay. If there is a simple one direct object, then we say that the verb is monotransitive. Okay. I stroke the cat, monotransitive. If there are two, so there is a direct and an indirect object, then we say that the verb is ditransitive. Okay, that's di, di-transitive. So when we say, 
I send my mother a postcard. This is diatransitive. There are two objects. If there is an object complement, okay, so usually the, it, there will be one direct object and then an object complement, then we say that the verb form is complex transitive. Okay, complex transitive. So as in the example, uh, the sun burnt the grass black. Okay, so you've got the object, the grass, so you think, okay, it's monotransitive, but no, because there is black, so it's complex transitive, because it's, this is a verb which actually changes the nature of the object, so it's complex transitive. Okay, so any verb form, you should be able to pick one of those four choices. Either it's intransitive, or if it is transitive, it's either mono, di, or complex transitive. Okay, and I expect you to be able to look at any sentence and say which type of transitivity is present. Okay, so again, you might want to just stop, pause that, make some notes, look at it again. It's not that difficult, I think. It's just a question of remembering the vocabulary that we're using, the technical terminology that we're using. Okay. Another split that we can make, a division we can make between types of verb forms, is into intensive and extensive verb forms. Okay. So again, th this, this is about remembering the terminology, but it's really very simple. Intensive verb forms are those which take a subject complement, okay? So it's the verb to be and all of those other words like become, like, like grow in this particular sense, like he, he grows old. Uh, all of those types of verbs which take a subject complement are intensive, okay? Everything else is extensive, okay? So all intensive verb forms are also intransitive, right? Because they don't take an object, they take a complement. But not all intransitive verb forms are intensive. If an, there's an intransitive verb form with no object and it has nothing, then it is not intensive, it's still extensive. It can only be intensive if it has a subject complement, okay? So any sentence you look at, you should be able to tell straight away, is it intensive or extensive, if you can recognize a subject complement. So, so long as you know what a subject complement is, you can easily tell, does it have one? Yes, it does. It's intensive, okay? It's intensive in that it's, it's subject complement, so the, the verb is about, uh, is about describing the subject. This is why it's intensive. Okay, and there is one more distinction that we need to make, which is between stative verbs and dynamic verbs. Okay, stative verbs obviously describe states, um, but it, it's not necessarily so easy to say which which verbs are describing states and which are not. So what we need to do is, is we need to ask ourselves a few questions. Dynamic verbs are verbs which can be in the continuous form but they don't have to be, okay? So the first thing, you look at a, a, a verb form, is it in the continuous? If it is, then it's definitely dynamic, okay? If it isn't, you have to ask yourself whether putting it into the continuous would change the meaning of the verb or not. Now, obviously, a, a simple sentence and a continuous sentence have slightly different meanings, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have these different structures. The question is whether the meaning of the verb changes, okay? So it, it isn't simply a question of whether there's any difference at all. It's a question of the meaning of the verb. So there are some verbs, right, which we simply don't use in the continuous. Verbs like understand. We don't say, I'm understanding you, okay? We say, I understand. Uh, so, of course... If you can't use it in the, I mean, when I say can't, right, every verb, except for modal verbs, uh, every verb can have ing stuck on the end of it. I mean, that, that's, it's not impossible to do that. Uh, however, so when I say can't, what I mean is that we don't really, right, that we, we don't use it in that way. Um, so there are verbs like, like that, like believe, okay. Uh, normally we, we use believe 
say, I believe something, right? I believe in God or something like that. However, there might be some situations where such verbs uh, are used in the continuous, but they, they, it changes the meaning. Okay, so take the verb think. When we say, I think it's a lovely day, think in that sense is stative, okay, because it means it's my opinion. Whereas when, I, when we say, I am thinking, of course, we, we can use think in this dynamic sense, I am thinking, but that refers to the process that's going on in my head, right? It doesn't refer to my opinion. So the difference between think as a stative verb and think as a dynamic verb is a shift in meaning. Therefore, a normal verb, when you say, when you use think about an opinion, say, I think we should go, this think is stative, okay? Because I'm thinking we should go means something, means something different. However, I should just point out, because this is based on usage to some extent, uh, there are variations. And it is becoming more and more popular in modern English to use uh, continuous progressive forms of verbs uh, where we wouldn't normally do so, right? So if you think of the famous McDonald's adverts, right? So people, you, you should say, I love it. But in the McDonald's advert at the end, they say, I'm loving it, um, which grammatically doesn't really make sense because well, you, you can say I'm loving something if you're in the middle of doing it. Uh, but it doesn't really make sense to say it as a general comment as they do. However, um, this is as a sort of slang expression has been around for a while. I'm loving it uh, to mean simply I love it. Um, and generally speaking, people are using the continuous form more and more. However, right, we're not going to worry too much about that. Uh, basically speaking, right, when you, to sum up this part about verbs, you've got a verb, you've got a sentence with a verb form in it. You can ask yourself, is the verb transitive? Does it have an object? In which case it's transitive. If it's got nothing, then it's certainly intransitive. But if it's got a complement, it's also intransitive. If it is transitive, has it got one, so it's monotransitive? Has it got two, so it's ditransitive? Or has it got an object complement, so it's complex transitive? We then ask ourselves, is it intensive or extensive? If it has a subject complement, it's intensive. If it doesn't have a subject complement, it's extensive. Everything else is extensive.